Welcome to another episode of Fight the Burnout. Uh, as always, this episode is brought to you by Create From Why. Uh, we have something special coming up next year, and we are talking about it a lot. It is a motorcycle retreat, not just a ride, but a retreat where we take, uh, we're take we going to take first responders and business professionals around Southwest U.S. on Harley Davidson's uh, and Sea Road, Sea Country. Uh, but most importantly, we're going to ride, we're going to grow, and we're going to recharge because uh, we've had a hell of a couple of years. Uh, I know all the first responders out there, especially, but everybody has. Uh, and so we want to help you recharge, regrow, and um, just kind of walk away from it fully um, impacted. It is literally based off of the trip that I did. Uh, but today we have a uh, special guest, uh, Jonathan. He is a ex-police officer, uh, and he's going to tell us a bit about himself here shortly. Uh, but he has uh, he's hit rock bottom. And he's come back and now he helps people uh, through faith to uh, really break through all of that. And so, um, Jonathan, why don't you take it away, as I always do. I let you introduce yourself fully. Tell us a bit about yourself, because I don't know you that well. And I'm figuring you probably know yourself better than I do. <laughs> that, that's to be determined. <laughs> well, you got it, man. I was a... Uh... So I was a cop for three years, um, but I also served in the military for 22 years. Um, so, I mean, my trauma and the burnouts all started from the time I was a kid. I mean, going through all that type of stuff. I mean, I was kidnapped three times um, before the age of six. I mean, uh, been raped, molested um, by family or not by family, but by people who were trusted by the family. Um, by my karate instructor, by the priest, you know, and then you, you throw in all my military stuff. And when I was a cop, I was just, I was honestly a ticking time bomb, just waiting to explode. <laughs> Far out, man. Now, this is going to be a good episode. I can already tell. Um, so <laughs> for everybody out there, get your pen and piece of paper because you're going to get some learnings today. Um, awesome. So, John, so. You had a ton of stuff already, you know, before you joined the military. Um, did you ever deal, talk about or work through or did anybody really know what what had happened? Obviously, being kidnapped, people would have known that that happened. Did you ever get any help or anything like that around then? I know this is probably back in like what the 80s, 90s kind of early 80s. Um, so the last time I was last time I was kidnapped was was when everything happened. I was about six years old. Um, and we were, we were gone for a couple of months, month or two, um, in Colorado. But when I got back, because just let's rewind for a second. So when I was kidnapped, my mom, the man who ended up adopting me, raising me as a son, um, they ended up while, while I was gone, they, they ended up packing up and moving to Michigan, um, because things were just, I mean, intense. And, you know, talking with my dad, uh, you know, it killed my mom that, that they had to leave. But it was, it was one of those situations where if she didn't leave, things were going to get really ugly. Nobody knew where I was to begin with. You know, he took me from Arizona to Colorado. So when, I, when they finally got me back, they, I did go through some counseling. Mm. But at I had learned at a real young age how to compartmentalize everything, you know, because when you're, when you're being molested by somebody or, or being raped for that matter, you know, one of the things that, that was put in my head at the time, you know, if you tell anybody, you're going to be the one that's bad, you know, not me, not any of us, you know, because it was, it was multiple people, you know, they watched while I had to do stuff to someone my age as well. Um, so when, when I was put in front of the counselors, it was, no, you know, you, you break out the, you know, you break out the doll, tell me where, you know, chest or touch, you know, like, no, there's, there's nothing going on, you know, mm -hmm. because in my mind, it was, I don't want to get in trouble. Yeah. I don't want to get this person in trouble. So they, you know, my parents say they tried to, um, but I wasn't, it was just, something that I had already learned to push down. Mm. So it was looking back on it now, I understand why um, why the, the treatment didn't continue. 
because it was, you know, for me, it was like, no, 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 nothing ever happened, you know? And then looking, as I look back at things now, hindsight being 2020, it was, why wasn't anything done? You know, because I mean, it was, I was a wreck. And I mean, I ran away from home, constantly getting into fights and, and running with the wrong people, you know? So it was just one of those things that I didn't address until almost towards the end of my career in the military. Mm. It was something that I masked, something that I kept down. And when it would come out, my coping mechanisms weren't the best. I mean, I was drinking all the time, partying. I was just dangerous to be around, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I bet, I bet. What would you say your definition of burnout is? <sighs> Oh, when you wake up one day and it just doesn't make sense anymore, Mm. you know, you're just tired. You don't, you don't want to do the job. The job's not fun or, um, you're just in that, that, that point in your life where nothing makes you happy. Mm. You know, if the the more you continue to carry the weight, the the more tired you become. And if you don't have that, uh, that release, especially that healthy release, you know, the world just becomes, you just become numb to everything. You know, that's, that's, that's my definition of it. That's how I, that's where I found myself when I was burnt out, just numb, didn't care, didn't care who you were. I mean, I destroyed relationships with friends, family, I mean, including my daughters. So it was just, and that's where I'm at. And that's what, that's what brought me out here actually <laughs> yeah yeah well i'm glad that you've worked through a lot of it so if we if we look if you look back and you went and you you look at um what were your before you joined the military what was your um what was your coping mechanism football baseball i mean it was sports mm-hmm. i didn't really i didn't really have that that coping mechanism you know when i when i was on the field it was just hit as hard as I could. Mm. Not, I mean, my senior year, I went out my first game because I, I mean, I busted up my shoulder, ended up having to have surgery. And it was just because I, I was just hitting people. Um, my freshman year, I had the, during the parent teacher conferences or whatever, you know, my freshman science teacher actually told my parents that he was afraid of me because of my temper you know and it was just I didn't care who you were it didn't bother me one bit you know so I I didn't really have any coping mechanisms back then I didn't because as a kid you know if I tried to talk about it I would get in trouble because it's not something that we talk about yeah you know it it reinforced what you're told as a as a six-year-old don't talk about this you'll get somebody in trouble or you'll be in trouble Uh, then it just compounded it they they don't want to you know, and I, and I, I get it. I understand because I, I mean, my mom took the brunt of it, then my sister and then me, but you know, that wasn't, that wasn't past. Wasn't something that we talked about. Mm. So, I, I mean, I can, I remember a specific time where I, where I was, my uncle took me out to an arcade center with his girlfriend when I was a kid. And I started just started talking because it was, I needed to get it out and he didn't know how to handle it. Yeah, you know, he was he was a dude, and so you know that he came back and told my parents, and it was just you no, know, that's not something that we talk about with other people. That's not something that we talk about anymore. It's just like, okay, well, I mean, let me just push it back down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll just I'll just crush it here. I'll just crush it here. Yeah, no, uh, this, yeah. Like my my upbringing was always talk about talk about everything. Yeah. yeah. I, crushing everything away in my policing career and I believe that's what saved me and I didn't get to a super super dark place it was because I just started to talk about like I started to have to talk to somebody about it and my mm-hmm. wife is very very stubborn in a good way where she just like kept dragging at it and eventually I did talk about it um before we jump forward into the military career because I know that there's going to be some more stuff there what would your recommendation be to parents or to kids that are you know still at home that have gone through stuff and are feeling like you did back then and it's funny you bring that up because i'm actually 
there's a 14 year old girl that I've, that's been on my heart. Um, she's, she's been down that road, mm. you know, and, and I talk to her mom almost daily. Uh, you know, my, my advice to them, to the parents specifically, pay attention to your kids, pay attention to the warning signs, you know, you talk to them. Don't, don't take, yeah, school was fine. Don't take that for an answer. Dig, ask more questions. Pay attention to who your friends are. You're good. Sorry about that, Jonathan. My dogs decided they wanted to go nuts. Um, you were saying about, um, you know, get kids to, you know, actually talk and actually don't take just, hey, uh, school's okay. Um, yeah. Where are we going from there? So it's just for the parents like i said you know talk to the kids get in their lives figure out who they're who they're around but pay attention to them while they're at home i mean quit throwing the freaking video games in front of their faces you know i mean it, it's 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 stupid i mean i can't tell you how many times i see look look at parents at restaurants right their kids are on their phone their parents are on their phone and it's just like well, who the hell's talking to the kids you know, where, where, what happened to that dinner conversation? You know, and for the kids, you know, you, you got, you gotta, you gotta talk. If something's bothering you, quit saying I'm fine. Quit saying everything's all right. And, and that's, and that's pretty much what, what I preach to everybody now is, you know, the, the more you talk about it, the less control it has over you. Yeah. And, it, and it's, you're going to, you're going to throw up some flags that say, Oh, you know, I need some help, something, you know, yeah, no, I totally, totally agree. Um, so if we now jump forward, obviously you ended up joining. How old were you when you joined the military? Eighteen. Eighteen. What drew you to the military? <laughs> uh, I needed to prove to my mom that I'd never be like my biological father. My grandfather, both my grandfathers served in the military. Um, my uncle served. And I, I grew up admiring my uncle, you know, because of his service. Um, so I knew right away that I was going to join. There was no, there was no question about it. But to me, it was because I, I, I had heard all the stories about who my biological father was, you know, what he did. He was a Vietnam vet, um, but I needed to prove to my mom that I'd never become that that man, and turns out I did minus you know the minus the beating the wives and the kids and kidnapping aspect of it but everything else you know I I tried so hard not to become I ended up becoming it yeah it's it's so, so that, true, that it's, so true isn't it? hard, it's so true it you, you focus so hard on not doing something that you end up doing it exactly it's, it's like I know you ride motorcycles I ride motorcycles what's the number one thing that they tell you to do don't look at the car when it's coming at you. <laughs> and I can tell you this in the middle of the night when those headlights are coming at you, it's really hard not to look at the headlights, but the amount of crashes that I've been to as a cop and also I've got a friend who's on serious crash and he's like, this guy looked at the headlights. This yeah. guy looked at the headlights. This guy looked at that and it's like, yeah. And, and it is, it's so, it's, it's so true when we get so wound up on, hey, I'm not going to go to this road that we end up going there instead of focusing on, well, where do I want to go? And down that track um so you joined the military uh and you served it was 22 years you said i eh? yeah 22 years and so it's 22 years and uh 10 deployments um numerous trainings and stuff like that i mean i was my first duty assignment i was there for th three three and a half years i was only there for a year and a half of that because i was always gone Mm. Now, that was my was deployments that became that became an addiction of mine because it was just let me go on the next one you don't catch 10 deployments without volunteering for a couple you know <laughs> you don't you definitely don't um what were you what looking back on it now what do you feel like you were um searching for by doing so many deployments uh death honestly i mean you get your you get a taste of combat but, you know, I started losing guys. And when that happened, things started to turn inside of me, you know, because I started to, I was losing good guys. Mm. You know, these guys were great husbands, 
great fathers, um, just great all around people. And that's what started to, where I started to question things. Why? That's where, when why started to come up a lot with God. You know, why God did you take away this person? You know, I've done way worse things than this guy did. Why wasn't it me? Yeah. You know, and it's something that, you know, survivor's guilt, you, yeah. you know, as well as I do, is, is a nasty son of a gun to deal with. It really is. And so the more, the more I deployed and, you know, get to certain locations, it was, let me, let me try and go home now. Let me die. And that's, and that, I mean, I was reckless, absolutely reckless on some, some deployments, but it was, but that's what I was chasing. Did anybody ever pull you up on it? Oh yeah. What yeah. Is- so my boss from, the worst one was in 2012. That was in Afghanistan. When I got back from that, my boss sat me down because I was sending him pictures um, when we got hit with IDs or when, uh, you know, RPG attacks, things like that. And he sat me down and was like, you're going to answer your, your post, your post health deployment assessment truthfully. And he stood over my shoulder and watched. So, so I didn't lie about it because I've always lied on those things because if you answer them truthfully, that comes with a whole different beast that you don't want to play with, yeah. you know? So it was just, he did, he called me out on it, on that one. Um, and it, and that kind of started the cycle of, of other things. How far through your career were you at that stage? Hmm. Uh, I retired in 2019. Okay. So... Yeah, it was a good chunk. You know, how many more deployments after that did you go on? Three. Three. I say you you put down obviously the truth of what was really going on. What happened after that? <laughs> take away the gun, obviously. Yeah. So that so the, the the whole thing of hey, they take my gun away. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> And then the cycle of of therapy started. So the first therapist that I went to. He's like, well, let's talk about your drinking. You know, tell me about that. I said, well, you know, I'll go through a 30 rack of Coors Light and half a bottle to a bottle of JMO. He's like, how often? I said, every night. He said, what? He, he was like, <laughs> he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I didn't last night because I knew I had to come talk to you. Um, but, you know, and I said, some nights it's worse. Some nights I can go through more than 30 or sometimes I don't even touch the beer and I'll go through a bottle, two bottles of Jameson and, you know, just so I can get some sleep. And then, you know, that got me bounced to a different doc. Yeah. It's just like, well, I don't know what else to do with you. So it, it, it went, it, I kept getting bounced around. And after getting bounced around for so many times, you just, you know, you kind of, you kind of throw your hands up, you play the game and then be like, tell them what they want to hear. So then they, so then they release you. I mean, the, the best part about it was, is when they put me in an anger management group, because I threatened to punch the captain, not the duty captain, if he were to take away the gym from me. So they put me in an anger management group and I'm in there and there's this big old round table. They're going, dude's going around, I'm sorry, so and so. I'm here for beating my wife. I'm sorry, so and so. I'm here because, you know, I have an anger problem. I yell at my kids, I hit my wife. And it gets back to me and I'm just, you guys are a bunch of effing bitches because I don't touch my wife. I'm not here for this, you know, and they didn't know my childhood. They didn't know my background, you know, so I ended up throwing a chair and the doc was like, no, I think you got some anger issues. I was like, well, what gave it away? You know, it was just like, (laughs) I made a big commotion and my doc at the time, he kind of poked his head out the door and I was like, hey, this isn't working. And I just walked out of the class and that was the last one that I did. (laughs) Yeah, I can see. I can see why it didn't work. You know, as a as a kid, bounced around, didn't work. Yeah. And you get further on, you get told, "Hey, you have to, you have to tell the truth, and we're going to help you." And then you get bounced mm-hmm. around, and you're like, "Oh, this isn't working." So I'll just go back to what I know. <laughs> Let me tell you what you want to hear, not what you need to hear. <laughs> yeah, I'm just tell you what you need, what you what you want to hear, so that so that it's over and done with. Because hey, I'm I feel like I'm coping fine. It's, everything's all good. 
I feel much better after throwing that chair. <laughs> that felt so good. It's funny, man. I, I used to say the same exact thing. Like, I don't have a bad upbringing. I actually have in the in the current climate a privileged upbringing in that i mean i sailed around the world with my parents on a sailboat and like didn't have didn't need to ask for anything and yet i had this anger issue that i used to openly say hey i've got an anger i've got an anger issue so there is times where i might get angry yeah. <laughs> you know, it's really thinking back on it it was all because i didn't feel like i was being seen by my old man because yeah. he went off to chiropractic school when i was a kid and i felt abandoned and i felt like i was being judged all the time and all these different the yeah. interpretations of a three-year-old kid, you know? And it's like, and now that I overcome them, I'm like, I don't get angry at all anymore. I'm like, yeah, that's somebody else's issue. That, that They're doing that because they've got some other issue. That ain't my issue. Because <laughs> I know my issues. <laughs> and so... <laughs> so so you, were in the, you were in military for a few more years, did a few more deployments. Uh, mm -hmm. Much more traumatic stuff happened over those times as well. Not so much. Um, there was, I mean, there was certain things that happened, but I mean, nothing like, nothing like 2012, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it was a, I mean, the only, the only thing that really put me in that burnout phase was when I lost my mom. Um, Cause she ended up passing away. She, she battled with leukemia Um and then, so she died September 4th and I did my last deployment October 3rd. So less than a month after, after her funeral, I was up and out the door again. So that was, that, that started a chain effect for me, a chain reaction for me because she had always been there to welcome me home on my deployments. She'd always been there to drop me off on some of the majority of them actually, um, so when I got home from my deployment, you know, she wasn't there. It just, I just mentally, it just, things just started to tweak inside my head. And, you know, I, I was good at masking it, good at compartmentalizing everything. You know, everything's fine. Everything's fine. And, you know, in the reality of it, I was, I was ready to, I was ready to go. How was that? Uh, was that deployment different at all? Like during the deployment? Did you act? What, it was um, reckless, reckless um, volunteering to do. I mean, we were all over the place. Uh, we worked in two-man teams and we were, I mean, I was in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Syria, Jordan, Qatar, you know, all over the place, hopping around, doing different things. And, you know, there was one incident and I was just talking to my, it was crazy that you mentioned that because I was just talking to my brother about it today. Um, one of the, one of the missions that I went on, it got canceled. We had to turn around because there was a, a pararescue man who, who had been killed over there. And I, I called back to my boss and I was like, hey, I'll be the one to go pick him up. I've already done it. These guys, some of, we had a lot of new guys on the team. And I was like, I'll be the, I'll go, I'll go do it. And so it was me and another dude. And when we were flying back, it was just me in the back of a C-130 and I'm just staring at this box draped with a flag draped over it. And, you know, I'm thinking about my mom, uh, thinking about the times that I've had to bring some of my other brothers back, you know, go through that. And it just, that right there, really, I didn't think it was going to hit me as hard as it did. But, you know, it was, it was at a point where it's just, I just had to push it down. But I just kept thinking, I just, I wish I, that were me inside that box. You know, because when I when I lost my mom, I mean, dude, she she was my best friend. So it just it kind of it kind of twisted everything up. I mean, when I was a cop, she came up and supported me, and everything else, you know. But it was just one of those things where you think you're strong enough to do it. Physically, I was, of course, but mentally, I was I was a wreck. I was broken. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's it, it's it's interesting those those little times that come up that we look back on now and we go, oh yeah, that was a that was a, that was a big red flag. Yeah. <laughs> How did I listen to that big red flag? Because <laughs> because that's a big red flag, like uh, in your case, big red, white, and blue flag. <laughs> Literally staring at you, going, "Hey, Jonathan, come on, wake up already." Um, okay, so 
So he came back from that deployment, had that going on. Yeah. What do you, and this might, you know, tell me if you don't want to answer this and that, but I'm pretty sure, I, I think you will just briefly that from what I know and how you like to serve people now, but what do you think stopped you from actually taking your own life up to this point or attempting to? I know you were doing being reckless in that. And I can relate to that. I used to do it on my motorcycle. That's what I used to do. I'd be reckless to go into a corner faster, push that corner a little bit more, hit that throttle a little bit harder coming out of corners or on the straights, hit it even harder. Um, but uh, yeah, I never got to that point of obviously, and I know we're going to talk about those kind of you, you actually did in a way, but what what do you think stopped you up until this point, you know, and, and just caused you to be reckless and put yourself into dangerous line more than actually doing it yourself? My daughters. Mm. Um, and it, it was, I mean, the last one that I did, the last one, it took them seven hours to find me. I was hospitalized the very next day. Um, but what people don't know were, was what I was ingesting at the time. Um, I had everything was planned out. I had meticulously planned everything out. And it was, I received a phone call, I mean, from a guy who I admired like tre tremendously admired this guy. And he called me some like 28 times. And on the last one, on the last one I answered and he could hear it in my voice, what was going on. He could, he could hear, there was something inside of me, like what I had done and little did I know he had, everybody was tracking. He was where he wasn't even in the same state as me. You know, and he was coordinating. There was huge, there was a lot of people looking for me. Um, but at the, ultimately, it was, it was my daughters, uh, which made me, which made me pursue the help. But then it just, you know, things just, they were good for a year. And then after that, it just, things went sideways again. <laughs> But that's what that's what brought me out to Nebraska now. So during your military career, what do you think? So you when did, when did you how far through your military career did you have your daughters? Your first daughter. Um. Oh man, ninety-eight, uh, ten, nine years. Nine years in. And in my career. Yeah, so they kept you alive for that second 13 years, yeah. that last 13 years of the military career. And then, yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. So, and then what got, what made you leave military? Time to retire. Uh, it, and it was, you know, what's crazy is that my last attempt was a month before I, I was set to retire. And that's how, I mean, that's how gone I was. It was, uh, it was one of those things where I didn't even want to finish my career. I was done. Um, but you know, because I, because I'd been surrounded by, by such good people, I mean, they, they fought tooth and nail for me. Uh, but I, I mean, I ended up retiring afterwards. My, I mean, I had already submitted my retirement paperwork. That was already, the date was already set. Or when I was going to retire. So on uh, just as I think I think I got confused a little bit there. So you you had tried or attempted to take your own life while you were still in the military. Yeah. So you did that last deployment in October, and then how long after that was it that you that you had attempted? So. Or was it before that? No, it was after I got home from the deployment. So we were gone from October of 2017 till almost, I think it was July, August of 2018. 
And then my last, I retired in 2019, May 5th of 2019 is when I retired and April 6th is when I had my last attempt. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was a month. It was a, it was a month before I retired that it, that everything went down. What do you believe got you to that? Or what do you know now um, got you to um, actually attempt? Because obviously you said your daughters had stopped, you know, it was your daughters that, you know, kind of kept you going through the whole time. What was it that was that final straw that kind of pushed you over? Because I know for listeners, it'll be very, um, well, at least I, I hope it's very educational to know, okay, this is what somebody else is thinking. So that either if they see it in somebody else or if they're experiencing it themselves, they can be like, it can hope, hopefully, hopefully my fingers, it's, it's a red flag and you go, shit, I, 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 I don't want to do this or yeah. they can relate, you know? Well, the thing with it was, is I was determined. I was already set. I started ingesting stuff early in that day and just kind of carried it out throughout the day um and then towards the end is, is when everything went into me into my body um so it wasn't like i would i, I what do you think something, mentally wise what's that what do you think mentally wise caused you to go okay i'm gonna do it or was it just a gradual thing and then i so i mean i i had already prepared for everything Mm. I mean, that day I woke up, I, I knew what outfit I was going to wear. I knew where I was going. I knew what my last meal was going to be. Um, I knew exactly where I was going to do it, where I wanted it to end at. So, but something that day told me to answer that phone. Mm. I don't know what, that. That's where that's where things get, I mean, I had buddies come out i had a doc come out that i don't remember talking to couldn't tell you the conversation she could i couldn't but it was one of those things where mentally i had enough mm. um, i knew that i had given or at that moment at that time i had felt that i'd given everything that i could but i was just done fighting it was because at the same time all this you know I'm, i hadn't grieved over my mom i'm still having night terrors of childhood stuff still having night terrors of, of things that have happened on deployment and it was just i when i hit that final straw it was that's it i'm done you know and i started i, I just completely isolated no i didn't talk to anybody i mean that day i drove around and i said goodbye to my ex-wife i went in i went to church that day but you could call it the last broadcast thing it was i wasn't there to make peace with god i was there to just kind of make peace with what i was doing what i had already started I wasn't there to hear a message or anything but then you know my daughters were at the same church unbeknownst to me but then i figured it out and i hid from them because i knew if i saw them i would do it i wouldn't i wouldn't continue to carry out what i what i had done so ultimately you know when i answered that phone it was the guy you know i've watched this guy talk somebody down off the i mean i personally watched him. the dude had a gun underneath his armpit, but I personally watched him talk this guy down. But something told me to answer that phone. And when I did, that's when he went in to do what he does best. And like, so, you know, people are showing up and I'm like, how did you, how did you figure this out? Mm -hmm. But if, you know, if people are looking for those, those warning signs, I mean, they say you can't tell, but you can tell when somebody's gone it's in their eyes it's in their tone the way they carry themselves are they isolating themselves from everybody else you know are they that same person i mean my brother today he's like i'm so happy to have my brother back i today was the first time i talked to him in two years wow yeah yeah 
So after that, so it was after that you joined the police force? Uh, so, no. So part of my time was spent in the reserves. So I did. Um, so I was a cop while serving in the military. Gotcha. A lot of my time was active. It, it's the way my career ended up. It was, it was active duty reserve, but then I was on active for just because of my career field. It was, it was, it so was you, had a combo of, you had a combo of everything going on those last few years. <laughs> going on, you know, so it was, it was yeah. a blast. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. Now, I know the final attempt that you tried to commit suicide is obviously you didn't, thankfully, and you're still here with us. Um, it was a bit of a story, which I'm very interested in. And I'd love to hear about how that kind of or was that one that you were just talking about? Was that the final one? And when everybody turned up, that was that kind of final thing. That, we that, was, a, that, that was the final one. The one previous to that was suicide by cop. Oh, uh, that's the one I want to hear. That's the one I want to hear about. And I want to hear it. And then I've got a couple questions about the in-between. Um, okay. Tell us about this, the, the suicide by cop, because I want to hear this one. And I also believe it'll be really good for cops out there, but also the civilians listening, because this just shows that the media out there on what they've been, you know, they throw out there all the time about cops is not always true. And no. Tell us, tell us a bit about what happened that day. So it was God, September 17th, um, 2015. Why does that so, date ring a bell from earlier in your story? That Because uh, that, when we were talking before, that's the date I told you. Oh, gotcha. Okay, cool. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that uh, date sounds familiar. Wasn't there something else that happened on that day? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I had just gotten... Uh, I had finished working 18 days straight. Um, yeah, oh, we, did, we worked 12 hour shifts. Um, so, and I was, I worked mids and I was filling in for other squads. You know, some of the other squads, I mean, the money's great. Let's be real. Money's great. You know, uh, and, and so that day when I'd gotten off work, that was a first <laughs> sounds stupid but it was the first time that i was going to be able to watch an Notre dame football game because i had at least two days off well my best friend dave was coming up and i was like him and his family were coming up and i was like dude i was like just let me sleep for four hours i'll be good you guys go chill around town come over to the house the barbecue will drink beer i got jmo you know but i'm watching my notre dame play right so you know he comes over i got it was like four, four and a half hours of sleep, and it goes straight into the JMO. And beer, we're barbecuing. I mean, I mean, this is my best dude. And uh, and everything was great. Everything was everything was golden. And then my ex-wife said something and it just I snapped. Um, prior to that, I had I had already I had reason. Before that night, about two months prior, I'd found out I had lost another one of my guys to suicide. And it just, I've lost 27 to suicide. And so it, it just, it, it sent what my, what my ex-wife said at the time and, and mentally where I was at because I wasn't processing it well. And it just, I was done. Prior to that, the other incident that I didn't really handle well was there was a guy who I was in the police academy with. It was, I want to say it was almost six months after we graduated the police academy. He was murdered. On a, and all he was doing, he was, he was the officer on the following day that was just responding, going back to follow up, do a supplemental report, right? So it was a DV that he was, uh, that he was catching information on. His name was Tyler Stewart. He was flag PD. Um, I, remember, I think I heard about that one. So it is, I mean, it's, it's sad, but it, it, I mean, meth head, dude shot him and executed him with Tyler's gun. Well, it's something that I didn't process and I had already lost so many guys. And, you know, at that point, you know, 
where I was mentally, I mean, I made it known that if you mess with any of the guys that I, that I worked with, you know, it was, it was game on. I didn't take any shit. Mm. You know, I, 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 I built my career and I, and I loved it. And I was always asked to make, right. And so it was like, I'm glad I'm not a cop today because I'd, I'd be on the news. <laughs> I'd, 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 I would, I would, because it's, 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 it's the things that, that we have to see that we deal with day in and day out. You know, that's the stuff that the civilian side, that the news, you know, they, they don't understand. And I get it. There's, there's cops are going to make mistakes, or, or there's going to be excessive force, or what is portrayed to be excessive force. But my my challenge to people is, if you can't, if if you're going to sit here Monday morning quarterback every thing that a cop does, take your ass out on the street, mm. go do the job, see if you can do it better. Yeah, this is you what know? I this is what I tell people all the time. They're like, oh, why don't cops do this? Or cops should do this, and cops should do that. And I go. <laughs> If you think you can do it better, go join, man. It's just a fitness test and an academic test to do it and some training. Go do it. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it when that getting back to that night, you know, it was it was done. I was like, which the what she had said to me, I mean, even my best friend was just like, whoa. And it just just snapped. Okay. Just snapped and i mean it got to the point where my best friend couldn't control me. he called my sergeant who was on duty working in another working in my city and i lived outside my town who ran code all the way to my house he could he couldn't talk me down and next thing you know here comes the local town pd yeah and i got something to say to them i mean i'm all fueled up on on JMO and, and and Coors Light and shots and and it was who are you? Don't come to my house. This is my house. Mm. We're gonna have to call in, you know, the other call whoever you want. Let's do this. And it was next thing you know, I'm standing outside and then let's do it. You know, they're trying to talk me down. They're trying to talk me down. And the entire time, I am trying to get a hold of my my ex wife, my the mother of my daughters, um, and because I just I needed to talk to her, and she just sent me a message: "You can talk to him tomorrow. Turn yourself in. Don't do this." And it was at that point. I mean, they had guns out. They had like a thing I mentioned to you before we started. I mean, it was, I was calling out their tactics, you know, they're trying to hide behind trees and stuff. And I'm like, the backlight, I can see your shadow, you know, I, it's funny, but it's not because it, it's something that it, you know, it, I still to this day, I hate the position that I put those guys in because these are guys that I've worked with before. They, they worked the town that was literally five miles away from where, I worked. So it was, I knew the guys, you know, I, I've been out drinking with the guys. Um, so at that point, uh, you know, they, they now go, there's a, there's a training that, that officers do up in Northern Arizona, I believe that's how to handle suicidal vets. Thankfully, the guy who really drilled it into my head, ex Marine, um, he had, I mean, this dude been, he had three officer involved shootings. He took the life of other, I mean, justifiable, but he was the one who pretty much got to me. And, it, and at that point, I was just like, all right, I'm done. My hands up right here. I took a step and pop, got popped with a taser. I hate being tased, hate being tased. Like in the military, I got tased, but for training, yeah. and I volunteered the times got a few screws loose but then um but this time it was you know took that full ride and after that i mean that's why i told you i'm i'm a huge believer in electric shock therapy you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. so so obviously yeah so the cops did absolutely everything they could they did all of that yeah 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm hearing a lot of in that situation. So that wasn't a thing of, hey, I want to take my own life. It just kind of escalated into screw it. You want, you know, let's just do this, get it done with. Then I can be, and I'm in, this is my interpretation. Uh, then I can just be in one of those, the, I can have that flag over my casket and I can be there. Because from what you said along a lot of the lines is you'd go, you do risky things. You would put your hand up for deployments because it was like, well, if something happens, it happens and it's okay. Yeah. And I hear a lot of that in that um, almost suicide by cop kind of story of screw it. I'm at this point. Let's just get this over and done with. Take me out. Just do it. Just do it. Mm. Whereas the next attempt was all on your terms. It was a, uh, okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm checked out. I'm done. Yeah. The one was situational and one is pre-planned, premeditated. I'm, I'm done with this, which the first one's scarier for our law enforcement. <laughs> yeah. Because that's very volatile. The second one is, can be scary for it. But what do you believe? Do you believe that the first one helped you to answer that phone call on the second one? Yeah, that's a good question. I think so. I mean, because I, I, I mean, like I told you, honestly, I, something told me to answer you. Something did. And I just, I can at the end of it, it was, and with him and I have talked numerous times after the fact. And it was, he had caught wind of he, somebody that people were looking for me at, as it was. And he had caught wind of it. And, you know, so it, I think that's why I may have answered that phone call. Mm. But it was, um, but ever, that one was everything was planned. Yeah. Planned to the team. The plant to the T. And like, and like I said, man, it's like when I, that night after I got tased, you know, they transported me to the hospital and they couldn't do anything with me because my BAC was so high. Mm. But all those guys, they all stayed with me in the hospital because we knew each other. We worked together and they would, they were coming in and we were just, I mean, it was, it was like nothing ever happened. It was like, we were just sitting there bullshitting with each other and you know they 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 just wanted to be there for me Mm. it wasn't until the chief of police from the town that actually responded came in and said all right you guys need to get out of here because we were just too busy in there laughing you know everybody was throwing jokes having a good time and it and actually the guy who actually ended up talking me down per se he he ended up moving into my old house that house where everything happened you know, so I, I hate, I hated the fact that I put my guys through that. You know, these are guys that I trained with. I love these guys. You know, we'd work out together at one of the local gyms. And it's just, but I, at that point, it was just, mm. I didn't, I knew that they would miss per se. Yeah. You know, I, I seen these guys shoot. Um, so it was just, and, and it's something that, you know, I've apologized for to those guys. You know, we've had talks. I'm actually looking for the the video of that night is actually being sent to me because I'm using it in the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, man. To show what happens, how long a person can be. Yeah. Um, so that, no, it's so much, so many good things, you know, and for those listening, it's it's one of those things that you never know where somebody is. But one thing that I've learned over all my uh, mindset and neuro programming training and all of that, and just from my own experience, is if somebody is very snappy, if they're snapping a lot, and if they're very aggressive and very angry, they're fighting some internal demons big time. Oh, yeah. And so recognize that, you know, recognize that out there. Do you think, do, do you think that by them being around you straight after that first, that first situation, you know, all the cops being around there, all the guys that you worked with, do you think that helped you? Or do you think that they, they could have been a little bit more like around the mindset, mental health side of stuff, a little bit push more pushing on you to really work, to get help. Looking no, back. It, they, no, that was, that was a huge help for me. Mm. Um, then a lot of the guys, you know, they went back to the house, removed all the alcohol, 
got it out. I mean, and this was the mindset of my ex-wife. She was pissed. She's like, why are you guys taking the alcohol? He's the one with the problem, not me. I mean, that's, that was, that was, those were, that's a quote. That's a quote, you know? Gotcha. And, and, and the reason we're not together anymore. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not a whole lot of support there. Um, and, I, and again, like this is my mindset. She obviously had a lot of her own, has a lot or had a lot of her own demons and that that she needed to deal with uh, yeah. to, to be able to do that. And this is why I, and I'm going to put a plug in here for my wife, because this is why I'm so supportive of my wife, because she is literally, if I went, okay, I feel like I'm an alcoholic and I get rid of all the alcohol in the house, she'd be like, cool. And she's got freaking 40 something gins on a gin trolley downstairs from all around the world. She'd still take them and put them somewhere else. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, get that one. Okay. So the guys went in and took all the alcohol and started actually doing all that support, the, the support yeah. stuff for that as well. And, that, then, and then I started to make that, you know, I, at that point it was, okay, I've got one or two options. I can either continue down this path not get the help or I can pull my head out of my ass and try and figure something out. Mm. So, you know, I started, I started going to treatment for, you know, for, um, started seeing a therapist. I mean, that night at least was clear headed enough that I actually made a phone call to one of my buddies who was a detective. And I said, I need the, I need the phone number to your therapist. And then after that, everything just went South, but I started to do that. And then, you know, I, I did the fit for duty. But again, you know, as well as I do, you can say what they want to hear to be released back because that was, I mean, I loved being a cop. Yeah. So how can I get back into it? It wasn't until I got served, um, with what with a long form where I was being charged and the officer who I knew she was like this isn't coming from our department your chief and your commander called us asking for the charges and I was just like you've got to be kidding me I yeah know. it was I, I see why you spiraled the second time now it was it was bad you know it was it was when I when I went into court the judge looked at me and he said, you're pleading not guilty, right? And I said, well, yeah. He goes, because if you were going to say something else, I was going to tell you, no, I'm putting this in for you as not guilty. And then I met with uh, the prosecuting attorney and he's like, all right, man, let's get this cleared back. Let's get this cleared up so you can get back to work. I said, I'm being, I'm, I'm facing charges right now. And on top of that, I got served with paperwork where they resignation in lieu of resign or in lieu of firing they're being fired. Well, I fought that. And it went to the city council and I sat with the mayor and it was because of those charges, which were dismissed with prejudice. And it was, are they all to do with the night? Are they all to do with the night that all the cops turned up? Was that the charges? Yeah. 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 What charges? Disturbing. It was, it was disturbing the peace and interfering interfering with law enforcement on a, on a well, I can't remember the exact charge but it was two charges none of the cops were, were playing victim they actually went to my ex-wife and were like would you like to be a victim and she, she was like no he actually obviously he needs help you know it's probably one of the nicest things that did she you ever get a chance to talk to the, the, the captain and the chief yeah I did did they yeah, say did. why they charged you they they would never admit openly that they were the ones that called for it. Mm. The, the prosecuting attorney was the one who called me or when I sat with him, he's like, your department has called my office three times asking, what are we going to file these charges? Yeah, it was ugly. And yeah, the thing yeah. is, after that, he was like, man, he's like, have you talked to an employment lawyer? He goes, because that should be your next call. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to fight this because I still wanted to be a cop. Yeah. You know, and if I if I were to try and fight my department, how's that gonna look going to another department? Mm. It was it was one of those things where it was just I took it as 
your time's done as being a cop. Mm. You know, I, I did a lot while I, while I was a cop. I accomplished a lot and it, you know, helped a lot of people. So I was happy with it. But at the same time, it left a bad taste yeah. in my mouth, you know, especially for my department. So looking looking back on all this, as we kind of wrap up, what are some of the like, what would you say are like the top learnings that you've learned over your whole life at the moment that you, if you could rewind, and I know I'm, I'm the believer that, hey, I'm, I'm grateful for everything that's happened for me or to me or however you want to say it, but I think for me, yes, I've hurt a lot of people. Yes, I've, you know, done a lot of damage to things. I've done a lot of good as well from it but I wouldn't be where I am. I wouldn't be talking to you right now if all of it hadn't happened. But if I could go back and teach myself some different things when I was younger, there are a handful of things that I would still teach, like love to teach myself. What would those things be for you? Talk. Get the help. Um, you know, I, it, you, you kind of, you kind of nailed it right there. There's, like I tell people, I've just been graciously blessed to have endured and survived a lot of this stuff. Mm. The reason I am so open about my childhood, my trauma, you know, the military, the police officers, because I've been rock bottom. Mm. And in the more, the more I talk about it, the reason I do it is because I'm, I'm trying to reach that person who was me who is there now, you know, and it's, and it's one of those things where, where if you can hear from somebody who's already survived it, who's to overcome it, you, you give that person hope. I mean, it's why I started the ministry that I'm doing. You know, I keep things real when I'm, when I'm preaching or when I'm talking with people, especially about faith. My faith played a huge, huge part in my recovery and my, in my ability to overcome things because I stopped looking at the bad I stopped hyper focusing on the bad and started to find the good in everything that happened to me, everything that I went through. You know, it'd be, I mean, just because I was molested, I, I can now empathize and talk with somebody that has been. Mm-hmm. And that opens up a door. Yeah. You restore that person's hope, where then the my hope is that they will take that, gain the strength to then tell their story. Yeah. Listen, I've already survived this, it hasn't killed me. I wanted to die, but look at me now. Yeah. Somebody who's actively writing, but because I say it all the time, somewhere there's someone right now writing that letter. Yeah. Getting ready to do the things that I've thought about doing or that I've attempted to do. Mm. So it's, you know, we, we get so driven, especially men. You get that, you get that, you know, you got that bullshit attitude of, you know, we keep it down. Men don't talk. Men don't cry. Well, I'm sorry, but that's killing me. Release it. Release it. I don't care who you are, how tough you are. Crying is a form of therapy. It releases Crying your emotions stuff, coming you know? out. Man. Crying is definitely those emotions coming out. You let it. I, I, I cry in the middle of drama movies and that. I'm like, I used to be like, no, 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 I'm not crying. Now I'm like, yeah, I'm being a little baby here and I love it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, got that, we got that stigma from our dad's generation. You know, you, you, men don't talk about their feelings. Men, you know, you don't, you don't talk about that stuff. And it's just like, well, who the hell am I supposed to talk to? Yeah. You know, how am I supposed to let this stuff out? Yeah. You know, and I said on, on the last interview, you know, especially in, in law enforcement and in military specifically, but focusing on your damn career and get the help mm-hmm. because you can't help anybody else if you can't help yourself. You can't save others if you can't even save yourself, you know, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for, you know, 22 zero because, and I, because of the the way they treat things you know the way they the way they handle military law enforcement things like that so it's just get get the help quit take the happy pills you know say save your marriages save your save your life it, it's, it's going to work out everything will be all right <laughs> i love it i love it the number one tip is talk it, it's it's so true you know i talk way too much half the time and i'm like no nah, i just talk the amount that I need to talk. 
<laughs> you know, sometimes it's absolute random gibberish, but sometimes it's actually really good stuff. And hey, it depends on the day, it depends on what you get. <laughs> I'm sure my therapists have called their therapists when I've left their office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let me get in right now. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get in there right now. I need to debrief off this guy because man almighty. Um, nah, <laughs> Jonathan, it's been, it's been awesome. Uh, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, how do they go about doing it? I've got a few of your links and stuff here, your email and your, and your LinkedIn, which we'll put in the description down below, but I, you know, like it if you just kind of set it as well so that people can, you know, write it down if they're, if they're listening or, or that. Yeah. So you, I mean, get, find me on LinkedIn, you know, it's just Jonathan Alcacer. Um, I'm the guy with the shaved head, crazy beard and the battle buddy shirt on that one. Um, you can email me at jonathan.alcacer at flandersfields.org. Um, cause I, I, I do a lot of work with them as well. Cool. Uh, and then I'm always, I'm always returning emails and returning phone calls. I, I'm always, I make myself available because I don't want anybody to, to be in that situation where I was in. No, I love it, man. I love what you're doing in that. And um, yeah, there, there can never be enough of us out there helping out first responders and and, and just being that um, being that person that can listen, listen to them, give them some of our experiences and that because uh, that's how we that's how we grow. Uh, last question I have for you, and I always ask this question. Uh, last question is, what would you what would you say your top tip to self happiness is? You got to become selfish. You got you to gotta, you gotta focus on yourself. That's, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the hardest things to do, yeah. but it's, but it's true. It's true. Like the moment I stop focusing on getting better for other people, getting better for my daughters, getting better for my family and just finally say, you know, I need to get better for me because I'm, I'm, I'm held to be around and you know, it's, and that's, but that's where I found, you know, where I found my happiness. That and my faith. It's, it's, I mean, it's, I pushed myself to, to become a better person by being selfish. Because if it's, it's like I just said, I can't help you if I can't even help myself. What do you say to those? What do you say to those people out there that? Because I totally agree with you. I say it all the time. You gotta, you gotta look after yourself. Number one, fill your cup up first, and then you can start to fill somebody else's cup. What do you say to those people out there that say, "Oh, but my husband, my wife, whatever, is so selfish. All they're doing is thinking about and doing stuff for themselves. They never do stuff for me." <laughs> Man, you gonna put me on the spot like that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> What, what do you what do you say what do you say what do you say to them? I've got my answer to it, but um, yeah. what do you say? Let me, to them? Be, let me try and be as PC as possible on this one. <laughs> I, I don't care if you're PC, bro. I'm not PC at all. I know. I know. I know. My what I would say to them would: Do you want to be at their funeral? Yeah. Do you want do you want them around to take care of you? Do you want them around? Do, are are you ready? to be handed that flag because if you're not then shut your mouth and let them do what they need to do mm -hmm. be there to support them and understand that they have to be selfish they have to be especially in the fields and you know in, whether you're a cop your fire ent your even i mean correction officers military they have they they're mission driven they're mission oriented so that's their mission right now and if and if their mission is to be a better person to learn how to cope and you're going to end up with a better product mm. so it's quit looking at it as a poor me he's spending or she's spending so much time on themselves well the end result is you're going to get a better spouse a better husband a better brother a better father you know I, I think you you are you're a spot on where where is different is I I know and I know you're I don't even think it passed through your mind is the time when they're doing it not to better themselves when they're doing it just to be selfish not like selfless as they kind of say but you need to be selfish to be selfless yeah so if you're not yeah totally and in my my case my response would be to 
communicate, talk. Yeah, that's it. Tell them what's going on. Tell them how you're feeling, man. Because hey, there you go. You feel you don't know. <laughs> My wife and I tell each stuff, tell each other, like we communicate so much that sometimes I'm like, I just wish you'd communicate less so that I could just bury it under the carpet and not say it. <laughs> yeah. No, man, I love it. Any last words, Jonathan, before we wrap up? You know, if faith for me was was one of the biggest things that helped me. You know, and I, and I, and I always preach it. You can't, if you, if you're struggling with your faith, where's your communication with God? Mm. You know, I said it on my last interview, you can't, you can't have a relationship with somebody you only spend five minutes with. Mm. So if you're, you know, listen, develop that patience, especially if you're praying. And that's, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's simple. It sounds corny, but it's, it's just, it's just one of those things where, don't give up. Mm. He still has a plan for you. You're still here for a reason. Figure out what that reason is. Yeah. No. No, I agree, man. I I believe in I believe in you. You have to know your purpose. You have to have a purpose. If you don't have a purpose yeah. for why, then that's it. If it's faith, if it's God, cool. If it's something else, mine is to help people see themselves. So they no, can exactly. help people actually see, truly see themselves. That is my purpose in life. Uh, and so this is why we do this podcast. This is why, you know, I get people like yourself on. I appreciate you being so open and vulnerable and talking about all of it because I do know that how much it helps um, and how much it helps you, how much it helps the next person listening. Uh, and so I want to praise you for that. I also want to thank everybody for listening and watching uh, this episode. Uh, has, is, it's, we've dug into a lot of different stuff. So I do apologize if it was triggering anything, but if it did trigger something, guess what? We just figured out what you need to actually talk about. So um, we are here to help. You can either reach out to Jonathan or you can reach out to myself. Uh, you can reach out to me at Chris at knocking demon coaching dot uh, com. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do everything we can in our power to put you in front of the right person and help ourselves. As we said, as I said, at the beginning of this episode, we do have a motorcycle retreat to help with all of this stuff. We'll help you work through your PTSD, help you work through your burnout because I've experienced it and I use motorcycles to go through it. So I'm doing it again for everybody else. We have a maximum of 10 people. Uh, and also before the 1st of October, we do have a discount happening as well for anybody who registers in by that full VIP. I, I shit you not. You, you get to Sedona, you don't bring your wallet out again until you leave. Um, so um, we've got that going on, but I want to thank everybody. Uh, remember, uh, you do matter. Um, my motto is always train hard, test easy, because uh, and that goes physically, mentally, emotionally, all of it. Train hard for it in a good way. Sometimes it's not comfortable. Um, so that when you do get those tests thrown at you, they are easy. Um, again, thank you, Jonathan. And we will talk to you guys all in the next one.